OBS has just fallen apart in terms of its quality, I have to say. It's very strange for such a commonly used uh, resource to be this low quality uh, in its release. I understand it's open source. I understand it's free. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. Okay, uh, so we'll be showing you how to do graphical effects like that later on in the course. Let's get going. GameStock, uh, GameStop stock is experiencing what's called a short squeeze. It's an interesting financial phenomena uh, where um, essentially short sellers have been trapped. When you buy a stock, usually you, you want it to go up, right? If, you, if it goes up, you can sell it for more money than you paid for it, you make money. If it goes down, you lose money, right? Um, however, short selling reverses this. You buy a share, you borrow a share for a limited amount of time, you immediately sell it, and then later on, you're forced to buy it back. Hopefully, the stock goes down in value so that when you have to buy it back, it is cheaper than the price at which you sold it. You get to keep the difference. If it goes up, however, you're in trouble. And if it goes up too much, you are forced to buy it immediately at that price. And people being forced to buy it causes the price to go up, right? Which forces more people to buy it, which causes it to go up, and then it spikes like this. Uh, this is called a, uh, a, a short squeeze. It's a really, really interesting concept. Um, at the very least, it's gotten GameStop's crazy, crazy activity lately has gotten a lot of people to look into these financial concepts, which is really good for their education. Uh, so anyway, it's not really related to game dev. It's just, it is perhaps the most interesting thing to happen to GameStop in a long time, which is, which is a games industry company. So, okay, let's keep going. Um, last lecture, we talked about components and composition, and we talked a little bit about the fact that you want your components to be small, you want them to be very straightforward in the jobs that they do, so that you can understand them, you can debug them. When something goes wrong, you know which component to look at and, uh, and figure out and fix. Well, if you make your components 5,000 lines long, if you give them too many jobs to do, then you're in big trouble. I'm gonna show you a component taken from Yandere Simulator. Uh, one of my friends uh, discovered how to basically uh, decompile the Unity code from this game. And oh, good gosh, imagine having this many variables, this much state organized this way. You've got, you've got hundreds of variables and you've got, I think, one function that is used. Here's the function. Here we go, well, go, 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 go. Oh my gosh. Every single, the only thing that is used for control flow in this entire component is if statements. That's it. Uh, no polymorphism is using, no inheritance, no interfaces. Um, we got our update function. Oh, right? Imagine trying to fix a bug in this code base. Imagine trying to add a feature. And you know when you, you know that there are, with any given feature to like even add a character to this game, you have to edit like probably 30 different lines of code to add that character in 30 different places. Imagine having a typo or putting it on the wrong line and then there's a bug that you don't know about. Oof. Anyway, it's tough. Okay, uh, you don't want your components to look like that. This lecture will show you how you want your components to look. Have them be very simple and have them be kind of hardy and flexible, okay? Um, okay. A very easy to use technique, 2D parallax. Parallax is a, an extremely, extremely useful feature. You'll probably use it on project two and three if you make a 2D game. The idea is sort of like when you're looking out of, out of a car. Things that are close to you move quickly. Things that are far away in the distance, like mountains, do not move quickly. And this gives you the sensation of depth. This is an entirely 2D game, but the fact that the nebula back here moves slower than the stars that are closer to your uh, character means that you get the sensation in your brain that the world is deeper than it actually is. It's full of depth and awe. Oh, just imagine the exp exploration you can do, right? And it's extremely easy uh, effect to, to implement. We'll talk about it a little bit later. Okay, Wednesday, we will be beginning on game design. Uh, we will be starting on Wednesday because you need to get this knowledge uh, before you do your Project One Gold, which is coming up. Uh, you've got about a week and a half until it starts. And on Project One Gold, you'll be required to implement a new mechanic and then a new level that uses and highlights and emphasizes different aspects of that mechanic. You've got a mechanic and then a level that explores it, okay? Uh, it doesn't even need to be a very long custom level. Uh, it just needs to explore several different ideas 
with your mechanic. It could be four or five dungeon rooms if you were doing Zelda. As long as each room is impactful and interesting and novel and well-guided. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is a funny announcement. So I'm releasing a game tomorrow. My company is, which is why I'm, I'm very sleep deprived right now, but that's okay. Uh, I hope it doesn't affect the lecture too much. Uh, it is a game called Goodbye Groundhog uh, on itch.io. Uh, it is a, a very simple and very short tower defense game in which you play as a groundhog, uh, in fact, a family of groundhogs, uh, who have been blamed for an, a non-ending winter. The, the, the moon has disappeared, winter has not ended, and of course everyone knows the rumor, right? When groundhogs see their shadow, uh, it causes winter to extend. And so, unfortunately, this rumor has caused the entire forest to turn, to, uh, turn against you, and you need to go warm their hearts and uh, defend yourself in a really simple tower defense game. Okay? Uh, so anyway, uh, hopefully it comes out and it's not too buggy. It's certainly not going to be very long. Uh, but that's okay. We only spent about two weeks and about 300 bucks on it, so it's okay. Anyway, uh, you can look it up. Uh, if if you uh, if you don't want to pay for the bundle, it's going to come in a bundle of 13 Michigan games, Michigan-made games. Uh, so if you don't want to pay for that, you can just uh, send me a message and I'll send you a free code, okay? All right, fun P1 bugs. Uh, I want to say something about P1 Milestone. Uh, in the spec, in the assignment spec, I'm pretty sure it discusses this. In the rubric, it definitely does. You don't need to have these tasks for P1 Milestone perfect. You don't need to have them perfectly authentic. You don't need to have them bug-free. They can be somewhat incomplete. They can be buggy. They might not always work yet. That's fine. That's what a prototype is. Uh, and if you look in the rubric, it says basically if the task exists, if it's in the game and is somewhat recognizable, you're getting those points, even if it's super buggy. There is no column for bugginess on your, your P1 milestone rubric, okay? Uh, on P1 gold is when everything needs to be bug-free and, and and very authentic, okay? Uh, but that's not coming up for, for about two or three weeks, okay? Um, uh, okay, if you're confused about any of this, you can always ask me on uh, Piazza or on uh, Discord. I, I get the impression that some teams thought everything needed to be perfect and, and maybe had a harder P1 milestone than they should have. The good news, though, is that if you did perfect some of these tasks, you're going to be at a really good place for P1 gold. You'll be ahead of the game, okay? <clears throat> Code quality is never checked in this course unless we can't get your game to run. Uh, we will know whether you're using the proper design patterns uh, basically based on how much sleep you get. And uh, you will want to use these techniques, okay? Uh, that is the key to doing well in this course. Okay, I want to show you some bugs uh, that are very common on P1. This is one where the game is showing the player that the player is looking to the right, but internally the game still thinks the player is looking downward. So when they shoot, uh, the bullet, the, the sword comes out of the wrong wrong end, okay? A very funny bug, not so funny on P1 Gold though. This one's particularly funny. <clears throat> Sometimes the cap on the number of sword projectiles that can exist, which is one at any given time, is not enforced. And so the game turns into Galaga, uh, or like a shoot 'em up game. Sometimes there are room transition bugs where maybe the player will move too much during a room transition and it will place you <laughs> into a really poor location. For instance, inside of a block where you can't escape. Uh, we'll talk about this. Uh, go to's are authorized. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you don't wanna, you'll regret that if you, if you start using those. Um, okay, so anyway, uh, all right. So by the way, this situation right here where you get stuck inside of something is called a soft lock. Uh, and uh, it's referred to as a soft lock. We'll discuss this tomorrow uh, on Wednesday as part of the game design lecture. Uh, but a soft lock is different from a hard lock, which is the freezing application you might be used to where you're working in Microsoft Word and suddenly the entire application goes unresponsive and then Windows tells you like, hey, this app is unresponsive. You want to close it? Um, this is a soft lock uh, where the game's still running. All the systems are still working fine, but the design of the game has led to a bad ending, a dead end. Uh, there's no possible way to progress the game because something has gone wrong, okay? Um, here's another example of when uh, sometimes the uh, the rigid body on your game object can get a drift to it where you like slowly move in a direction even though you're not pressing the arrow keys. Uh, here's another one 
uh, that reminds me of a movie I saw. I think it was a movie called Wanted. I think it was an Angelina Jolie movie where there are a bunch of assassins that are able to shoot a bullet out of their guns and then have the bullet actually curve through thin air. Uh, and so this is an instance of shooting your magic sword projectile one way and then turning and having it curve and go a different way. Okay, uh, here's another example. This one is extremely common. If you look at this here, Link is actually moving his butt backwards when he thrusts his sword. Um, this, this looks really poor. It feels really poor. And it makes combat really hard because your sword barely extends. Um, during normal gameplay, Link's torso is meant to stay here and the sword goes out instead of jumping back, right? Um, this is a problem with the anchor point on this sprite. This sprite where the Link has his sword out, uh, the anchor point by default is going to be in the center of the sprite. But in reality, to get the right effect, it needs to be in the center of his torso, okay? It's, a, it's like a... It's a 30 second fix if you know what you're doing. Uh, just go in to the sprite editor on that sprite and then just drag the, the, the pivot point over. Uh, this is an issue with the UI. Uh, if you don't set your canvas scalar component to um, uh, scale with screen size, scale with screen width, something like that, you'll get this effect when you build the game. Your UI will look really weird and, and poorly sized when you make a build. For Metroid, Google Slides is not wanting to let me progress to the next slide here. Okay, uh, zoomers. Zoomers are a really, really fun enemy to program in Metroid, uh, but they can potentially be very difficult to, and the bugs are very, very fun. Uh, uh, zoomers can often get themselves lost in midair and just spin around trying to find a wall. I'm sure some of you have seen that. Has anyone in chat seen that? Um, there is a, there is another bug, uh, I like this one as well, where you're in a morph ball and you're in a tight space, uh, but the game forgets to prevent you from unmorph balling and you get yourself jammed into the ground. That's not good. Um, another uh, fun bug, probably my favorite bug that I've seen in Project One, is a bug where the zoomer uh, looks at the player and says, yeah, that's a wall, and uses it to get to the ground and escape. Uh, it's extremely, extremely fun. And this bug in particular looks like it could be a really cool game mechanic to me. Uh, you can imagine a custom level where Samus gets a suit, a special suit that allows her to have zoomers climb without taking damage. And your entire objective is to uh, help uh, zoomers get to a certain location in the room to hit a switch to open a door or something and you have to be at the right place at the right time to help the zoomer climb okay to route the zoomer around that could be really cool <clears throat> don't let me design your game for you though uh, you you should uh, make the custom mechanic and level that you want um, so long as it can meet the game design criteria we provide on, on Wednesday okay Okay, you've got an assignment released today. If you look at the calendar, if you look at the schedule, uh, you, you should be currently working on P1 Research. Uh, you should be working on, uh, you should be finishing and submitting P1 Milestone. If that's not in, you've got uh, less than 24 hours to get that in, uh, so please do so. You've got P1 Alpha launching today, and you should be doing your project management, of course. Let's take a look really quick at uh, P1 Alpha. This is a very, very similar assignment to P1 Milestone. It's just your task set has been has gotten different, right? You have more tasks now, and that might actually scare you. You have more tasks. That's going to be nasty, right? The good news is that the tasks that you need to do are very, very similar to the tasks that you've already done. So in P1 Milestone, you've already implemented an enemy. Now you need to do four or five more. You've already implemented a weapon. Now do two or three more. Um, and remember, for P1 Alpha, it doesn't need to be perfection either. It can be buggy. It can be incomplete as long as it's in the game. You'll get those points. Uh, and then for P1 Gold, you'll have to fix it all up. Uh, so, okay. Let's keep going. Kind of, a, kind of a boring assignment. It's a little bit longer. You don't have five days. You have nine days. So you have a week and a half um, to get that done. Okay? Okay. Um, what I'd like to do uh, is I would like to... I would like to show you, you know, I've been saying a lot recently, 
hey, you want to build your game by building lots of components. You want to build components that are small and simple and easy to understand and debug. You want to build components that are hardy and reusable, that just work no matter where you put them, right? No matter what game object you put the component on, it's just gonna work. Um, but I haven't really given you any concrete examples of what that looks like. And so what I wanna do is I want to go back to your very first assignment, your rollerball assignment, and I want to show you how you could add a health and damage system to your game using two very, very simple components and add some enemies uh, to the game as well while we're at it. And we're gonna do this really, really fast. So let's go ahead and open up Unity. Ah, ah, it's, oh, it's gonna be a long night tonight, I'll tell you that, okay. So let's go ahead and uh, open up uh, our composition example here. We're going to make a few changes to get rid of the previous section's work. I'm going to uh, munch on an egg while we load Unity here. Anyone, uh, does anyone in the chat have a snack? Anyone uh, have a drink? What are, you, what are you snacking on? What are you drinking? The slides will show up in the schedule after this lecture, okay? So it's gonna show up right here. In fact, I'll probably put them in right now because the first uh, section is probably wanting to to uh, join us here. Oh, that looks horrible. Eight, oh my gosh, very laggy. Okay, let's go down to eight and let's make sure this wraps real quick. There we go. Cool, all right. Okay, we've got jasmine tea, we've got a pear, we've got uh, water, coffee, Taco Bell, nice Kool-Aid, all right. This is one of the few times I've appreciated Unity's slow loads. Hello. There we are. Okay, good. All right. So here's our rollerball. It isn't. It isn't quite what uh, what the uh, the rollerball that you made, but it is largely similar. Um, so let's make sure we uh, that we uh, get rid of some of the components that we created. Okay. Got rid of that. And we're gonna get rid of the box collect. <coughs> Blah. Okay. We're also gonna get rid of this. And we're good. <clears throat> okay, so this is essentially rollerball. I'll prove it to you. Let's go ahead and roll around here, and uh, we can we can collect things. We can jump around. Uh, this is a little bit unique in that we have uh, this orbital camera that where I can use the mouse to kind of look around a little bit, and we've got this trail render that looks pretty cool that follows our watermelon. But otherwise, it's essentially what you uh, had at the end of tutorial one. Okay, um, I think I need to remove a component from our player here. Yeah, we'll remove has health, and I think we're good. It, our player has a movement script. It has a, a, a restart if below script, a collection script, so it's all good. Now, here's the question. <clears throat> Let's say that we want to upgrade this game. We want to introduce the concept of enemies, Enemies that damage you, and damage means that there must be some sort of health system in our game too. Uh, and so the question is, how would we create something like this? How would you do it? Well, if we want enemies in our game, uh, the requirement for an enemy, at least right now, is that the enemy just needs to deal damage to our player and inflict some knockback when you touch the enemy, okay? Maybe we can make them move around later, but for now, <clears throat> we'll keep it simple. You might be very, very tempted to create a new component for the enemy game object. We would go to this game object, the sphere right here, the enemy, and we would create a new component on it and call it is enemy or something, or enemy component. However, that would not be the best way to do it, okay? Uh, because uh, we might want other you know, we might want other things in our game to be able to damage you if you touch them as well. Like this floor. This floor is red, so maybe it could be lava. 
If you touch it, it should do basically the same thing an enemy would do. So remember back to our composition lecture. When you're creating and designing components and figuring out which ones you need, it really, really helps to think of components as adjectives. <clears throat> so what does an enemy need to do? What does an enemy have that makes it an enemy? How do we take any game object and make it an enemy? Well, an enemy is a game object that when you touch it, it does damage. Okay, that's fairly simple, right? Uh, but to do damage, we need to have something have health. So let's go to our player and we're going to give it health. Okay, which and think about adjectives. Let's create a component called has health. And we've done this three times so far. So we're going to create has health three. Okay. The idea is any game object that has this has health three component has a health value, okay? And is capable of taking damage and being destroyed if their health goes too low. So we could give this to a player, but we could also give this to an enemy. And we could give this to a wall if we want the wall to be breakable, for instance. So has health. Oh, Visual Studio is giving me another. Oh, no, it's too short. Can't can't take another bite. Okay. So has health. How do we build a has health component? Well, pretty simple. Let's go ahead and create a float variable, and we're gonna simply call it a health. And let's say all uh, all everything in the game that has health is gonna start at health 100. We could make that more fancy later. Uh, maybe make a max health variable, stuff like that. Um, but the next thing that this has health needs to allow is not just storing the current health, but it needs to allow some way for us to change what that value is. So we'll go public, void, adjust health, okay? This is the API that other classes and systems can use to adjust the health of this, uh, of this character, of this game object. So we need, it, we need to uh, allow users of this function to specify how much they want to adjust the health. So we call this delta, okay? Now delta uh, is the value by which we're going to change our health variable. And if our health becomes smaller than or equal to 0, 0.0, we need to destroy this game object, right? Because we've run out of health. In reality, you probably don't want to immediately destroy your game object or, or character when they run out of health. You probably want to play some sort of death animation or something. Um, but uh, we'll keep it fairly simple, okay? And that's it. Like, that's it. That we're done with the component. If something has health, then they are storing a float that represents their health, and they provide a function that lets you adjust that health, okay? And potentially, if that health value gets too low, the game object goes away. All right. A very, very simple component. And it's now it's now on our player. <clears throat> ah. Okay, so now we need to write, uh, we need to create our enemy. Now our enemy uh, needs to damage the player when the player touches it. So what we can do is we can say, hey, let's create a component called adjust health upon touch, okay? It's kind of adjective, adjective-y. Okay, so adjust health upon touch. This component name essentially tells us exactly how we need to program, doesn't it? So we got adjust health on touch. Let's uh, let's get back here. Let's double click to make sure that we have it. Okay. So uh, in terms of uh, APIs, what we probably want to do is say, hey, the, the, the designer should be able to say, hey, how much do you want to adjust? Adjustment amount. Okay. And we'll set this to a default of like negative 25. Um, and then, how do we detect when we've touched something? Well, we probably want to use a, an on trigger, on trigger enter. There we are. Okay. And then we have a couple requirements, right? We need to adjust HP of the thing we touched, and then we need to apply knockback. And we'll fill both of these out. Um, the first thing we want to check is okay, we touched something but can we even adjust health on that object? Does it even have health, right? 
we might touch a wall that has no has health component and we can't really do anything to that wall, can we? So we'll do this. If other, as in the thing we touched, that get component dot has health three uh, is equal to null, as in, you know, if we have, um, actually, let's go ahead and store this in a variable. Has, has health three, uh, other HP, we will use get component to grab that component on the other object we touched. And if that component doesn't exist, as in if it's equal to null, uh, we're gonna go ahead and return because we can't really we can't really do any other logic until that other component has the component that they need. The other game object has the component they need, okay? But if they do have the, uh, the uh, component they need, what we'll do is we'll use that a function, uh, adjust health. How much do we want to adjust health? By this amount, okay? One of the interesting things about this function, right now you're thinking about this function, this uh, this component in terms of, hey, it lets us damage enemies, right? It lets us damage the player. It lets us damage any uh, game object that has health. However, what happens, chat, riddle me this, riddle me this. What happens if I take this negative amount and I make it positive? What happens if this adjustment amount isn't negative, but it's positive, it no longer looks like an enemy, does it? Or a trap or a hazard, it looks like what? Yeah, it does healing. And it, enemies don't heal, but what does heal? While I finish my egg here. Bingo. Bingo. That's right. If we change this adjustment amount to 25 and not negative 25 and we put this on another object, suddenly it looks like an item. Suddenly we have an item implemented, right? So it's, it's kind of crazy how reusable the simple component already is. Okay, so the next thing we need to do uh, by the way, we need to uh, always write some code and then test it before moving on to other features. So health change uh, to, let's do this, um, other HP, uh, actually no, let's put, it in the, let's put it in that function, okay? So within adjust health, uh, whenever our health gets adjusted, we're going to, oops, we're going to go ahead and we're going to print what that new value is. Okay. And then we're just going to make sure that our collisions and all that are working. So we're going to go bump into that ball and hopefully our console uh, will tell us that our HP has been adjusted to 75. Okay. Come on, Unity. Come on, come on, come on. All right, we're good to go. <laughs> okay, the next feature that we need to implement now that the previous feature is working is we need to implement knockback. So this is the idea that when we hit another game object that has a rigid body, as in, if we hit another game object that um, uh, uh, has, is physically enabled, we want to set it flying, right? You don't want to just take away some health. You want to, like, bump it, set it flying back so you can see, ugh, right? There's an impact. It's painful. So uh, what we're going to do uh, is uh, we need to check to make sure that that other object has a rigid body in the first place. If it doesn't have a rigid body, uh, then we need to bail. But if it does have a rigid body, then we need to apply some sort of force. So we'll do add force. But the question is, what kind of force do we need to add? This function requires a vector 3 uh, in order to actually apply it. So let's go ahead and create a new vector 3. This is going to be our force. And OK, what should the force be? Well, the force we apply should probably the, be the vector that points from the enemy to whoever touched us, right? 
So from ourselves to the thing that, that hit us. We can get that vector really easily by going other.transform.position minus our position. It's always destination minus uh, origin to get the vector that goes from the origin to the destination. So there we go, transform.position, and then we have our vector. Now we probably also want to have some upward motion to this vector, so what we'll do is we're gonna add in uh, a little bit of upward motion. So vector3.up is probably fine. Um, and then we want to normalize this vector. We want to normalize this vector and multiply it by some value that will give the power of the knockback. So we'll update our API a little bit. We'll give the game designer freedom over how strong of a knockback effect this is. So knockback magnitude. And let's set this equal to something like uh, 250, okay? All right. So we need to multiply uh, by that amount, and then we should be good. Okay. So there it is. That's kind of a long line, isn't it? We'll go ahead and make it a little bit shorter. Cool. So we'll apply that force vector. We've written a, a nice chunk of code here, so we'll now test it. Let's uh, let's go and uh, bump our uh, our ball. Bump our enemy. Hello. All right. Good. Okay. So let's go see what happens. Oh, didn't work. Okay, so now we have to figure out why. Good thing is we only wrote a tiny bit of code, so we can probably figure this out pretty quickly. Okay, so let's go ahead and write a little bit of output to just figure out what happens. So let's see, knockback one. And then let's see if we get past this check, knockback two. And then we can see uh, what our force is right here. Knockback force. And then we'll print out, see what kind of, uh, what kind of value we have, okay? All right. So now we'll filter our debug messages by knockback. Okay, we'll play it again and we'll see what happens. Okay, we're rolling, we're rolling, and ooh, we only got to knock back one. So this uh, is blocking us right here. Ah, oh, that line of code makes no sense at all. If other RB, what does that even mean? It should be if other RB is equal to null, all right? Ah, it's easy to make small mistakes like that, particularly if you are uh, if you if you're not sleeping super well. Uh, so, but you can easily find these issues uh, by taking this iterative approach, right? You write a little bit of code, you test it. A little bit of code, you test it. Something's wrong, but because you only wrote a little bit of code, you have very few suspects to go back and investigate, and so you get the the bug solved very quickly. Boink, is, do you see that? Oh, it looks great. Like boink, ouch, ouch. Ugh. right? Okay, so it's working, it's great. And now I think if I get hit one more time, I'm gonna get destroyed here. And I got destroyed. So it's working just as we expect it to, right? And this is some pretty cool behavior for what is otherwise a super small and easy to understand component, right? All it does is it simply checks if the thing I touched have health, and if it does have health, adjust health. It sees, hey, is the thing I touched, does it have physics? If it has physics, calculate a force and apply it. That's it. But we get this really cool behavior out of it. Um, the last thing I'd like to point out to you is we used this on an enemy, but we could easily use it on an item as well. Um, and we have this red block here, right? This red block uh, could be uh, lava. What if the designer wants to make this a lava pit that you had to jump over? Well, what we could do is we could just simply add that component. Uh, let's just add the adjust health upon touch component. We'll add it, and uh, let's make this a little bit more painful to touch. We'll give its knockback a little bit more power, and then we can uh, test it out. Notice we haven't written any components that explicitly are hard-coded to be enemy-related. We're just writing some very general and reusable components 
and uh, we just mix and match them. Whoa! Oh my gosh, that's a lot. Yeah, that was a little bit too much. Uh, but uh, yeah, so but but here's the takeaway: you write simple components that are hardy, so they check they check for the existence of other components, and they know when to bail. Uh, and uh, and you mix and match them. They're generic enough that you can apply them to many different game objects throughout your uh, throughout your project. Okay, I'd like to show you one more thing. Uh, chat, what do you think would happen if we accidentally added two, two adjust health upon touch uh, components, right? If we added two of these components to the same game object, that would be kind of weird, right? Because you'd apply damage and you'd apply knockback twice. And we don't really want to do that. And so what happens, you know, we don't want our designer, our game designer to accidentally add two of these. So how can we make our um, component even more defensively programmed. Well, what we can do is we can use a special attribute up here. Attributes in C Sharp are ways of essentially um, adding information to a certain function or a certain class that other parts of your system can use. So Unity, for instance, if you add the disallow multiple component attribute, then uh, it won't let you add a second component. <clears throat> So let's go ahead and look here. We've got uh, da, 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 da. we got one adjust health upon touch, but if I accidentally add another one, it will tell me, hey, I can't add that. Uh, it's already added, right? Awesome. Another cool thing you can do, and this this doesn't necessarily make sense uh, with the particular instance of it, but if you ever have a component that requires another component to work, what you can do is you can say, hey, Unity, um, require component. What component do you want to require? Require a has health. There you go, has health three. So in this case, if I ever add an adjust health upon touch component to a game object, this has health three component will automatically be added. And then what I could do is I could do something like this. Uh, get component has health three, uh, and I can uh, get a reference to it and I can do things with it, right? So anyway, um, I'll show this to you really quickly just to prove that uh, this is how it works. <clears throat> okay, so let's go ahead and remove our adjust health and then we're gonna click it right there and boom, I added a adjust health upon touch component, but we've programmed it to be dependent upon, <clears throat> upon has health three. So that dependency is automatically added, okay? Uh, so it's pretty darn cool. Let's go ahead and clean this up though, because that really makes no sense at all. Things can things should be able to deal damage without themselves having damage, like a spike wall. Maybe you never want the spike wall to be able to be defeated and destroyed. Uh, so it doesn't need health, but it should still adjust health for things it touches. Okay, that's enough of that. I think you get it. Uh, pretty pretty simple example, but that's generally how you want to write your components. <clears throat> if you want to see how this plays out in the uh, realm of a commercial and larger kind of uh, release. Uh, a larger game will have a ton of components like that that are all super reusable and super generic and super flexible. So what you can do, as it turns out, is you can combine them, many of them, to create different and unique components without writing a single line of code. So uh, I'm gonna show you an example from a, a tower defense game that we're currently working on and, and getting there on. Uh, uh, and we, in this tower defense game, we have three kind of different types I want to show you. We have a tower game object. In this case, it's the clam you see here. <clears throat> There's a clam, it kind of spits at enemies, and it's all good. We then have a unit game object, which is like a person or an animal that can actually walk around and fight things, uh, as you can see here. Uh, she's going to kick the crab in a sec, I think. Um, we also have a map unit. It's sort of like a unit, but it's dedicated to walking around on the, the, the stage select screen, okay? So, what can we do? Well, if you look at the components that is, are on the tower, the units, and the map units, if you look at them all, there are a ton of components, and they're all relatively simple, and many of them are actually reused across multiple objects. So it has data. The has data component is literally, it's kind of like the has health component. Uh, 
except it's a has health component that can store any statistic. So health or attack or um, uh, uh, currency or defense or speed or vision distance. Uh, it's essentially a dictionary of string to string or string to int that just allows you to assign a stat to a character and allows you to read that stat if you want to, okay? So all three components share and reuse that logic, which is very helpful. Two of these, the in-game unit and the in-game tower, have an has team component. This has team component is a storage component uh, that essentially uh, gives a team association to a unit. Uh, units on the same team aren't allowed to fight each other, and units on the NPC team are special, as in no unit can fight them, and they won't help out in any fights at all. So uh, one of the cool things about having these components and having them so simple is that at any moment, it's very easy to, for instance, get rid of someone's team or to change it. You just destroy that component, and suddenly they have no team, right? And everyone will attack them. It's very mean. Um, there's another component that's shared, has desired position, right? So has desired position. All three of them have it. The center one is hidden by Google at the very bottom. But has desired position means exactly what it says. If you have that component, then you have a 3D point in space that you want to get to or you want to shoot at, depending on the other components you have. For instance, if you look, the tower has a can fire component, which causes the tire to fire at its has desired position uh, location. Uh, the, uh, the unit game object has a can punch. Essentially, that should be can melee uh, component. Uh, Where is it? Can punch right here, meaning it can actually physically hit something. Um, you could have a component that's a unit that ha can fire and it also can punch if the unit ha uh, t happened to have like a gun or a some projectile weapon, right? Okay, let's keep going. Selectable. The selectable game object means you can hover it and click on it and do affordances and stuff like that. Has vision is shared across these two. If you want to blind a game object, like give it a status effect of blindness so it can't see or it misses things when it fires, uh, you can just get rid of the has vision component. Easy, right? So that's the idea. You want a lot, you want a ton of tiny, easy to understand components that you can kind of attach to a game object, mix and match. Uh, to create really interesting stuff, okay? Uh, this is a particular game. Uh, well, I'm not going to tell you what the name of it is because it's not really finished. And I, I think the build that's currently up on our website doesn't quite work since we're doing a ton of refactoring right now. Uh, but uh, it is, uh, yeah, I'm not going to tell you what it's called, but it's it's pretty, it, it's pretty cool. I like the, I love the artist who worked on this, Sam Olson. Just fantastic, fantastic artist. Um, okay, let's keep going. It uses a lot of the same technology that Goodbye Groundhog does. Uh, so if you play that game, you'll sort of be playing this beach game. Okay, uh, P1 architectural considerations. Let's go. BTD stands for Beach Tower Defense. That is the code name. Every Arbor Interactive game has a three character short code. Just for some of our backend software and stuff. <clears throat> not, not Bloons Tower Defense. I wish, I wish. That would be pretty great. But I prob if, if, if I made Bloons Tower Defense, I probably wouldn't be teaching. <laughs> be living it up on a beach or something. Okay. I don't, I don't actually like beaches that much. I'd be in a cabin way out in the mountains. Okay. So I want to talk to you a little bit about P1 architectural strategies. Uh, the idea that you finished P1 Milestone. You've created your first enemy. You've created your first weapon. But now you need to create more of those things. So what kind of architecture can help you scale that out in a way that's going to be effective and efficient and reuse code and avoid copy-paste issues, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and, and think about that for a little bit. You have three enemies here, okay? You've got the Stalfos, you've got the Gel, and you've got the Goria. You have a few more in the actual project, but these are the ones we'll consider. Now, your objective, let's say, is to get them moving. Okay, you just got to make them move. And um, what's interesting about these enemies is that when it comes to moving, they move in a pretty similar way, don't they? Right? These enemies all move kind of on the grid, on a tile, sort of like in Pokemon, right? There's a very pronounced movement grid. Uh, 
Uh, and they're a little bit unique, right? The gel kind of stops and starts, uh, but the Stalfos and the Goria work very similarly. The, the Goria kind of stops and starts too sometimes when it's firing. <clears throat> um, but your objective is to get them moving. And so the question for you is, okay, should we create one component and have all three of these enemies use that component? Or should we create three unique components? The Stalfos move, Gel move, and Goria move, right? And there are, there are pros and cons to both of those decisions. And you're going to have to make that decision pretty quickly. The advantage of going with the one component route is that if you have one movement component that all three of these enemies use and reuse, then you have dry, right? Your movement logic is only in one location. So if you fix a bug in one place, it's going to fix that bug every place, which is really, really nice, okay? It's also really easy to reference in a generic way. Here's what I mean by that. If you ever want to, for instance, turn off the motion on a game object, um, then all you have to do is this, get component, movement, and then dot enabled equals false. You just turn off the component. It's really, really nice. Uh, a question in chat. Um, they all share the same movement logic, but have different AI logic for determining how to move. Um, yeah, I mean, so so one thing you could do if you wanted to make this one component is you could add some properties to this component, some public, you know, public bool blah or public int blah. That might determine like, hey, when should I stop? How long should my stops be? Stuff like that. It should be random, should be something else. Um, and then you might have AI that determines when this is going to be enabled or not. Uh, disadvantages of this approach is that this can be kind of challenging to implement, right? These movement patterns are very similar, but they're a little bit unique, right? So you need some ways to adjust how the component works, and that can be very challenging. Um, an advantage of going with three different components uh, is that it's much easier to implement, at least to begin with. Um, right, you just, hey, you just knock out each one. You just write the custom code that you need for each one of these game objects. You're not reusing anything. If you do reuse any logic, you're copying and pasting all that logic in. Uh, however, that comes with some very nasty downsides. Uh, it fails dry, the dry principle. So copy pasting is going to happen, and if you fix a bug in one of these three, you have to remember to fix it in all of the other movement components that you have potentially in your entire code base. And this gets worse the more enemies and the more movement-related components you have, okay? And another really nasty thing is that you cannot reference this generically, okay? Here's what I mean. Here's what I mean. Let's say that we want to turn off movement for this, uh, this enemy when we touch something. Let's say you create a custom mechanic where you've got a weapon that freezes enemies in place. Well, what you can do, if you have only one common component for movement that everyone is using, what you can do is you can reference it generically. You just do collision.getComponent. So get the component on the thing that I collided with and turn it off. It's easy. You know that the enemy is going to have the movement component because that's the only movement component that exists. However, if you have one movement component for every unique enemy, it's going to be a pain in the butt. You're, what you're going to notice is that you get into this pattern, okay? You have to manually grab every uh, uh, component type and turn it off because you can't just say, hey, grab me the movement component, okay? Because they'll ask, well, which one do you want? And it's actually worse because you can't write just three lines. You need six because your uh, Stalfos might not have the gel movement component. Your gel might not have the Stalfos movement component, so you have to make sure whatever you're touching has the component that you, you want and turn it off. You have to do all of this. It's very nasty. And what's even worse is that every single time, every time you create a new enemy and a new movement component, you have to remember to add two new lines to this uh, piece of code. This logic needs to grow by two. And let me ask, are you going to remember that? Are you going to remember that every single time you need to? What if an intern were to join your team and, you know, creates 
a new enemy with a new movement component, but has no idea that this bit of logic even exists. Guaranteed bug, right? Guaranteed bug. What happens if you add a, uh, what happens if your teammate adds a new movement component to the game because you're sick or something? And the, um, and they're doing your movement related work and they forget, they don't know about this, that they have to maintain this logic. Then you've got a bug. Suddenly your freeze weapon is just not going to work on that enemy until you, you find that issue and fix it up. And so in general, in general, if you ever write a piece of code and you think to yourself, you know what, I need to come back and update this code every time I do something else, that is really not good. Okay, that is just going to generate bugs like no other because you probably will not remember to maintain all of the various maintenance points that you need. Okay, and so if you ever find yourself writing this code and saying, hey, I, I know I'm going to have to come back here if I ever add a new item to the game, if I ever add a new enemy to the game, if I ever add a new level to the game, then that's bad news. That you should that that is a, a hint that you need to uh, take a different approach. But what are the different approaches? Well, here is a different approach, okay? Well, actually, uh, here's something to consider. Think about this. What if we added a bat to the game, right? These three have very similar movement, but this keys does not move remotely like these three, okay? Do you want to create one component that can handle all four of these? No way. It would be next to impossible to do a good job writing one component that deals with all four of these different movement styles. These three are very similar, but this one is totally different, okay? Uh, if you try and do that, you're gonna end up with a 4,000 line uh, component that is super complicated and big and does more things than it needs to, and it's hard to debug, so don't do that, okay? You would want to create two components in this case. Here is two ways that you could fix your issue of maintenance, all right? So, one issue, one thing you could do is you can use inheritance, okay? Instead of having a uh, humanoid grid movement, or, or instead, of, instead of having a, a Stalfos movement, an Agoria movement, and a Gel movement, what you can do is you can have a humanoid grid movement component, and then for the keys and the bats, you can have a flying component, okay? Flying movement component, and they will both inherit from movement or movement component. By inheriting, what you can do, if you look in the bottom left corner, Google's going to block it if I take my cursor down there, but what you can do suddenly, if you look down there, is you can just refer to the base class component, and the get component function will give you whichever one is on that object, okay? So by doing this, we have gone from this setup, which is super unmaintainable and doesn't scale well at all, to this nice one-liner, which does scale, okay? Uh, so that's a really, really nice approach. You also share logic. So if there are certain variables and certain functions and piece of logic that are shared between your flying movement and humanoid grid movement, then you can put it in that base class and you get back a little bit of dry, okay? Reduces the odds of copy-paste bugs. Another thing that you can do is you can take the intent component approach. An intent component, uh, for instance, let's say you create a has intention component, it's just a component that stores some control logic on it. it. It stores a variable, like a bool, wants to move. It stores a vector three, desired position. You can think of it like a brain, okay? The brain has desires and information that your hand component uses, that your leg component uses, that your mouth component uses, okay? And so your Stalfos will have a has intention component. It's the brain of the game object. <clears throat> And what it will do is uh, in the bat movement, so this is keys, the keys will have a has intention brain component and within its bat movement component, it will grab it, it will check to make sure that it exists so it has a brain and make sure it wants to move. And if it wants to move, it will actually execute that movement, okay? Uh, that bottom line there. In the other component, like humanoid movement, it will do the exact same approach. It will grab the brain component that has intention. It will check to make sure this game object wants to move, and if, if not, it doesn't move. As a result of this, you can now re reference and, and uh, turn off 